Good. Okay. Well, greetings, everybody. Uh, great to see you all. And uh, we have a nice, healthy group here on ground in the uh, Scott Ring Room. We have a group at North Hudson, and we have a robust array of some 71 and, and growing colleagues coming in through WebEx. So um, I want to thank all of our IT uh, personnel who are helping us refine this, clearly this new normal. Um, uh, our ability to use WebEx plus ITV uh, and have a good quality experience no matter how you are participating. Uh, it's getting better every time, and uh, please give us your feedback because uh, we're learning from every experience. I welcome you all. I apologize to those who are coming in through WebEx because we have lovely refreshments here. I'm sorry. <laughs> But it's really great to see all of you. Our first town hall meeting, partially on ground, can you believe it, since March of 2020. Thank you all for being here today. Before I start, um, a little birdie told me just a little while ago that we have someone today celebrating his birthday. And that is Dr. Daryl Jones. Um, so do we want to sing? I, can, I can't sing. Can somebody start us? Happy birthday to Birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dr. Jones. Happy birthday to you. Woo! Now, I mean, I ask because typically what happens is when you do this, someone else is also, is anybody else celebrating the birthday today? Just out of curiosity. Or if you are, you're probably not telling us. Okay. I uh, hope your fall semester is going well. Our recent fall convocation, I don't think we've had a convocation, I don't think we met in a town hall since we had our convocation. So I just want to take this opportunity to say what a great program that was. Most of you were there. Uh, the theme was faculty and student engagement, a commitment to success, certainly an appropriate theme. And I hope you felt as I did that. The speakers' meetings and conversations were really outstanding. So I do want to take this opportunity to thank our valued colleague, Director of Staff and Faculty Development, Lisa Williams, Vice President for Academic Affairs, and the birthday boy, Dr. Daryl Jones, and members of the plan, Planning Committee and so many others for organizing this day of professional development for our college community. Thank you very, very much. It was really, really, really meaningful. At last week's meeting of the Board of Trustees, the Board approved a memorandum of agreement that's an addendum to the college's current contract with the Professional Association. I'm having problems here. Um, the MOA modernizes the position description, structure, and compensation for our valued faculty coordinators. Our Professional Association officers and administration have worked for several years to revise the long outdated model for faculty coordinator compensation and also um, activities. And we had begun this discussion in our last negotiations, but realized there was too much to consider in order to complete the reform then. And instead, we agreed in good faith that we would work together to update the model before our next contract negotiations. So this has been a work in progress since 2019, when the current contract was ratified. It then was slowed in part due to Eric Friedman's departure from HCCC and, of course, to the pandemic. But we're proud to have worked collaboratively to get this done, uh, working closely with one another to achieve this, I think, really important positive outcome. Just prior to the start of our new contract negotiations with all four unions, which begin the month after, well, it'll soon be the month after next, can't believe it, to begin in January. So I want to take this opportunity to thank our PA officers, Michael Ferlis, Tony Acevedo, Dorothy Anderson, Dr. Serhan Abdullah, and our cabinet officers. Special thanks to Veronica uh, Zeichner, and very special thanks to Dr. Daryl Jones, who really led us through the completion of this. Like all, like all things we do through participatory governance, it's not perfect. Nobody has gotten everything they, they would like in this, but it's a step forward. It's progress. And we're proud of it. So thank you. Thank you very much. And while I'm speaking about faculty, I want to touch upon a conversation we had at our recent monthly meeting of professional association officers and several cabinet colleagues. We meet monthly. 
uh, and I agreed to um, share with you. I, I, wanna, um, I want to, to let you know that we are committed um, in the administration to considering full-time faculty lines when there are vacancies in full-time faculty or lecturer positions, when enrollments are increasing and uh, that increasing enrollment um, warrants additional full-time faculty and or when there's an opportunity and we're looking for these to convert several part-time teaching positions into one or more full-time positions. We really do believe in the importance of full-time faculty engagement because of all that um, adds out beyond the classroom to uh, student success and student engagement. Our process always begins with the consideration of enrollment trends and needs and the financial viability of filling vacancies or creating new tenure track faculty positions. So when there's a vacancy, it's not automatic that another full-time faculty member will be hired. You know, if it's in an area where enrollment has declined over time uh, and it wouldn't be financially prudent for us to invest in a replacement position, we're, we're, we're not going to do that. But I do want to say that as we're able, we'd like to grow our overall FTE faculty complement over time. Current financial challenges are an issue, but we want to make progress as we are able. And that's really a commitment uh, here. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, I had the distinct pleasure of attending the Association of Community College Trustees Annual Leadership Congress in San Diego with a robust and enthusiastic team of 11 trustees, faculty, staff, and students. Attending with me were trustees Bakari Lee and uh, Pamela Gardner, Sharon Daughtry, Veronica Girasimo, Jose Lowe, Amala Ogburn, Juris Pujols, Warren Rigby, Allison Wakefield, and Elisa Williams. And the conference theme, Advancing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, was delivered in inspirational programs at a level, at a level I've never before experienced at a professional conference. And of course, uh, very appropriately, during the conference, Hudson County Community College was introduced and celebrated several times as the winner of the ACCT Northeast Region Equity Award. We were proud of the widespread recognition of our work to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion, which was the intense focus uh, of all the meetings there. And speaking of pride, Trustee Gardner, Vice President Juris Pujols, and North Hudson Campus Associate Director Amala Ogburn presented a workshop for conference attendees about our college's DEI initiatives, and that made all of us proud. So on that note, I'd like to invite Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Juris Pujols, and PAC Day co-chairs Lalisa Williams and Jose Lowe to offer a DEI update. We'll start with uh, Juris, followed by Lalisa and Jose. And I would ask speakers to come to this podium where you'll be heard and uh, seen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Willie. Uh, it's so nice to see all of you here in person. Uh, my peeps from North Houghton, to see you on television, and uh, everyone uh, plugging in from home. Uh, you know, it's exciting to see how we're little by little we're coming back, right? So uh, as, as Dr. River mentioned very briefly, uh, I want to provide a couple of updates uh, of some of the work that we're doing at the office. And then Jose and Elisa will talk about some of the initiatives that are taking place at, uh, at PAC Day. So uh, first of all, as uh, we uh, reported uh, previously, we're working on uh, four different initiatives related to the grant that we received from the state of uh, New Jersey. And the first one speaks to the, um, to the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion certificate programs that we're going to be making available to, to all of you. And th that speaks to uh, various levels, like three different goals within the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion action plan. Because, uh, you know, when you talk about 100 or 150 uh, certificates that we're going to be able to issue over the next uh, two years, that means that our faculty, our administrators, our staff, our students are going to be able to partake in this experience, bring it back, and be able to diffuse, you know, what they learned throughout the, uh, throughout the college. Uh, our plan is for us to t make that into a turn turnkey process that we're able to develop our own training module to make sure that we continue doing that. That would also address goal two of the action plan in the sense that it would also, um, we'll be able to create diversity advocates that will be uh, assigned and will be placed in the screening committees. So, you know, all of that aligns uh, with that. Uh, we also have a Title IX uh, training program that, again, is going to be open to the entire community, to uh, employees and students uh, alike. 
There are going to be multiple uh, options, different times. Uh, and again, the idea is to continue promoting uh, an inclusive environment when everyone feels welcome, right? Independently of, uh, you know, uh, sex, ethnicity, uh, gender. And uh, the, both of those uh, RFPs, we put them out. Uh, they closed yesterday. We have a significant uh, e enough um, responses to, to assign a bid. So we're hoping to move forward with that very, very quickly. Uh, there's another part of the grant that speaks to the um, to programs, to initiatives, and uh, that's specifically to anti-racism um, uh, awareness, uh, bystander awareness, uh, and other trainings and programs. That one, unfortunately, we didn't get any bits this time around, so we're reworking it. I'm going to be putting it out very quickly. But uh, many of you have been communicating with our office, with me and Natalia, with suggestions, ideas, like what type of speaker we should bring in. You know, we'd like to encourage you to keep that engagement going because this, you know, this effort belong, belongs to all of us. And uh, one of the programs that will come out of the, um, the programs of the engagement is something that we're titling uh, uh, Decolonizing Higher Education. It's going to be an engagement series that is going to take place outside of the classroom in which all of us will be able to engage in certain historical themes and uh, occurrences. You know, and, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we tell history the way that he, that he occurred, in a way that makes all of us proud. But with that, I thank you for your time, and I want to give an opportunity to uh, my partners, uh, Lilisa and Jose, to speak to us. Thank you, yours, and thank you, Dr. Reber. Hello, everyone. As, co as one of the co-chairs for the President's Advisory Council on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which you hear it referred to as PAC Day, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that PAC Day is doing, and then I'll turn it over to uh, the other co-chair, Jose Lowe, to tell you a little bit more about some of the wonderful programming. But PAC Day, uh, one of the main things that we're working on is to make sure that we're fully aligned and integrated with the new Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And so that we didn't have to do before, but so we have to do that. And as you well know of any, you know, about integrating, it takes time and there's a lot of interaction that has to happen. But as the uh, council, we, we're still meeting uh, once a month. And our key role is to be able to have meaningful suggestions and ideas and recommendations to advise the president on. And so we're very glad that we're able to do this great work. So some of the things that we're currently working on is to um, institute regular monthly meetings with all of the subcommittee co-chairs. We have four subcommittees and two co-chairs for each committee. And we've already had a first meeting and establishing that monthly meeting so that we can all interact and make sure that we're not um, duplicating our efforts, but that we are all supporting each other. Another thing that we're doing that's pretty big is that we are creating a formal set of bylaws. When we started PAC Day, we didn't have that. We were doing that, and we're drafting them now, and we hope that as soon as we're finished with that, we'll be able to share them college-wide. I won't go into the programs. I'll let Jose do that, but I do want to share one program that we're offering this fall under PAC Day, and that is a program that we're entitling Women in Higher Education, Voices for Advancement. And you'll see the Save the Date flyer coming out. Uh, we've already identified a group of those from Subcommittee 1, which is Goal 1, which deals with programming and training and things of that nature. Uh, we've already identified four individuals. We've asked all of those people have accepted. So I do believe I can at least give you their names here. Our very own Dr. Nadia Headley, our very own Dr. Janice Baptiste, our very own Nicole B. Johnson, and our very own Janine Nunez. And the date is December 6, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. So you'll see more. And thank you for having me. Jose? All right. Uh, exciting time, isn't it? Exciting times, uh, folks. I, I just want to say that we just came back from this conference, and it's, it's excellent to hear that our program, our DEI program, PAC Day program, is nationally known. I think that's something that we need to keep saying to ourselves, that it's nationally known. It's not regional. It's not only New Jersey, but it's throughout the nation. And um, our, our name, uh, the work that we've been doing has been, you know, told so many times in, in their periodicals, 
in the literature that we got in our hem, in our, in our bag, we had Hudson County Community College uh, name in them. So that's something to be said, folks. And um, I want to just give, you know give my round of rough applause to our Pike Day co-chairs and everybody's doing a lot of great work, a lot of great work. So folks, we need you guys to also uh, participate on those activities. So we got the barbershop uh, actually it's today at two o'clock. So if you got some time today at two o'clock later on today, make sure you join the barbershop where uh, uh, Mr. Williams, Omar Williams is going to talk about the father's wisdom. Uh, we also have some activities through the cultural affairs. Um, and, um, you know, some of the things that's happening, it's happening and we're putting it together. So folks, please, you know, look, read your email, attend, ask us questions. I don't mind coming to see you or your department to talk more about what Pack Day is doing. One of my pet peeves and people tell me is like, what you guys are doing? Well, ask me, you know, I'll tell you, you know, so come over and find us and we'll tell you. All right, folks, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you all so much. Um, and, uh, you know, Trustee Gardner is a member of the ACCT Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I happen to be a member of the AACC Commission on Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity. I can't get them to change DIE into DEI. I think DIE is a terrible acronym, but nonetheless, we have our, our quarterly meeting next week in Washington. It's on the ground in Washington, D.C., and I've been asked to share our story there. So I'm looking forward to that. For those of you who might not be aware, our valued colleague, Dr. Paula Roberson, is planning a statewide virtual teaching and learning symposium on social justice in higher education in March of 2022. The symposium is sponsored by our Center for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation, which, of course, Paula leads. And I've asked Paula to share the plans for this event today. Paula. Probably need to unmute. Thank you, Dr. Bieber. There you go, you're good. Okay, today I come before you, good afternoon everyone, to invite each and every one of you to participate in our social justice symposium. This symposium is an extension and product of our town hall meeting immediately following the brutal murder of George Floyd. Since then, the Center for Teaching, Learning and Innovation has conducted various professional development workshops and two summer book discussions centered on racial and social justice issues very relevant to our history and contemporary national issues and daily lives. Our higher learning institutions are positioned to make a difference in teaching and learning about these highly sensitive issues which affects each of us directly and indirectly. The plan is for various institutions, divisions, disciplines, and committees from student affairs to workforce development all across the institution to address contemporary social and racial justice issues and how they have advanced or impacted positive change within the higher education arena. Some of those issues include, but are not limited to reproductive justice, consider the politics of the recent Texas abortion mandate, COVID disparities, police reform, Reentry initiatives, environmental justice, climate change, dumping, eminent domain, freedom of speech, addressing the school to prison pipeline, the media treatment of missing BIPOC persons, and much, much more. The list can go on and on. There is a place for each one of us in this reawakening in America. My point to all of you is that colleges and universities have always been at the forefront of social justice initiatives. Remember Kent State in May of 1970 with the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations, the numerous colleges that canceled speeches or had controversial speakers on campus by inflammatory groups and removed Confederate statues from their campuses last year. At Hudson County Community College, we are and can continue to be relevant to raising awareness of these social justice and racial issues and be a harbinger of change in the work that we do. The Social Justice Symposium is one way to impact change in the lives of our students and professionals with whom we interact with every day. We can impact change through administrative, academic, and classroom processes, 
with data and research on contemporary issues that impact the student learning experience. The Center for Teaching and Learning and Innovation is at the leading edge in New Jersey's community colleges in hosting this social justice symposium. Dr. Fickner, president of the Council of County Colleges, believes this symposium is important. This work aligns with the college's mission, the strategic plans relevant to professional development and other goals of leading entities at the college. It is hoped that Hudson County Community College will lead in the range of scope, depth, and breadth in their participation for the benefit of our students and flex and stretch our professional development muscle and experience. These social justice symposium sessions will be held in February, March, and April. We look forward to your participation. And if you have a pen and pencil handy, I'd like for you to take a resource down let me help you decide on what you could do. This resource is Anti-Racism Daily. The website is hello at antiracismdaily.com for very informed reasons. reading. Again, hello at antiracismdaily.com. Thank you, Dr. Riva. Thanks so much, Paula. Thank you for your leadership. This is a big deal, and um, Dr. Fickner has sent information and the flyer about this to all 18 community colleges and to New Jersey's four-year public and private institutions, and all are being invited to participate. The November issue of the Insight into Diversity National Magazine showcases the 101 recipients of the Higher Education Excellence in Diversity, or HEED, award including Hudson County Community College and nine other community colleges in the nation that have been selected as what the magazine calls top colleges for diversity. There truly is so much to celebrate here. Our return, moving now on, uh, we could call, talk more and more, probably all day about DEI and, and about all these topics. But next, uh, I want to turn to our return to campus task force, which continues its dedicated work to lead, advise, and support our community. I'm pleased now to invite our RTC task force co-chairs, Lisa Doherty and Dr. Heather DeVries to offer an update. Lisa and Heather. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see so many faces in person. Uh, I wanna start by just really uh, continuing to offer our thanks and gratitude to the entire Return to Campus Task Force and especially the working groups and especially our health and safety group. Um, I think we can all agree it is um, it's exhausting. <laughs> we can't believe we're still uh, meeting and talking about really important issues on a weekly and biweekly basis. And I just really, we really appreciate the guidance of all of our working groups and the participation of everyone on the task force. And it, uh, you know, it's really gratifying when we talk to other schools that we really do seem to all be, you know, paddling in the same direction and at most importantly relying on the guidance of the health and safety group, which continues to be our North Star. So I wanted to um, take this opportunity to remind everyone that we are still offering vaccines and now boosters on campus. Both campuses, the North Hudson Community Action Corporation is back. Uh, they are offering now both Moderna and Pfizer, first shots, second shots, and booster shots to those who are eligible. So they are uh, and the North Hudson campus on the first floor in 105S. Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays from 8.30 to 3, and Journal Square in the library, um, 8.30 to 3 on Thursdays and Fridays. So if you have not yet started your vaccine uh, regimen, this is the time to do it, and you can just walk in. You don't need an appointment for any of the shots, first, second, or booster. Just walk in, and they are there. Um, I really do encourage those of you who perhaps are not fully vaccinated yet to sort of look, do a backwards timeline, and then if you are to be fully vaccinated before working on campus this winter or spring, you really need to start the regimen very soon, if you're doing a two-dose regimen especially. Uh, if you're doing a one-dose regimen, um, I'm sorry, yeah, Johnson & Johnson, we don't have that on campus, but you would have to do that, of course, um, you know, two weeks before returning to work in the spring. So please just keep those dates in mind. Time certainly does fly. And we have those vaccinations right here for you for free, walk in. 
Secondly, I wanted to uh, refer you to, we did send an email last Wednesday the 20th regarding the uh, removal of the standalone air purifiers. If you haven't reviewed that, please do so. And I just wanted to remind everyone that we purchased those as a temporary solution until our state-of-the-art uh, filtration systems were installed. So our air quality is of the highest quality right now. Those who have questions should really reach out to Ilya um, who can clarify, and I will add that our health and safety committee is in the process with, uh, of conferring with Ilya and some of our uh, engineering friends to recommend any places where we may want to retain the standalone purifiers. So looking at what are the circumstances where perhaps we would retain them. But at this point, we're really confident in the, uh, the technology that we've installed. And lastly, uh, I want to remind everyone that registration for winter and spring begins this Friday. It's hard to believe. Honor students and vets, Friday. All other students, Monday. And we will be monitoring very, very closely the registration reports to confirm that students who register for on-ground classes have their vaccine proof submitted. So uh, we have a plan. We are going to be uh, running reports almost daily to identify those students who have not submitted their vaccination. Um, cards and reaching out to them to make sure that they adjust their schedules. If you come across students that have a concern about their ability to get the schedule they need based on their vaccination status, please refer them to return at hccc.edu. And I want to thank in advance and also um, those of, who have already helped the associate deans in helping students get the schedules they need and working with them, especially those that are close to graduation. So those are my updates, and I will turn it over to my very capable partner, Dr. Heather DeVries. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I have a few other reminders as it pertains to the vaccine requirement heading into spring semester. Um, we are pleased to share that we have 293 employees who have already submitted their proof of vaccination, um, but we know there are certainly more out there who do need to submit. A reminder that tomorrow, October 29th, is the last day to submit exemption requests to human resources. To date, we've only received a handful, um, and the deadline is tomorrow, so we're figuring at this point the majority of people just need to get around to submitting, submitting the laser, laser fiche um, form with the proof of their vaccination. Employees are submitting proof of vaccination through laser fiche. Um, the email link circulates every so often. It will start to circulate more. I have to say I did mine earlier this week. It took two minutes. It was very, very simple. Um, and if you don't have a picture of your vaccine card available, it's very easy to download the Docket app. You can download a PDF of your, your COVID-19 vaccination record and upload that to the laser fiche. That's actually what I ended up doing. Very, very easy. Um, and I'm happy to make myself available if anyone needs help navigating either the laser fiche process or the Docket process. Um, just give me a call, extension 4660. Do be mindful that the laser fiche link expires after 24 hours. That's part of the reason we're going to start sending it more, more regularly. So I believe one circulated yesterday. So you probably have until later this afternoon, maybe end of day, to use that link. So I encourage everyone after this town hall to go back, go into your email if you have not submitted already, and submit that. Submit your proof of vaccination and cross it off the to-do list. We all know how good crossing something off the, our very long to-do lists feels. Otherwise, for students, they are submitting through a slightly separate process. They have a smart sheet link, which we've been using very successfully for months now to date. A little over 3,800 students have submitted proof of vaccination, which is really, really awesome. Um, we will continue to monitor that number. And then just a, a plea that for those who are interacting with students in, class, in the classroom um, or through services, please make sure to do a check for understanding, make sure they're aware of the vaccine expectation for spring and help them navigate the process accordingly or refer them um, to, to the Return to Campus Task Force for, for questions. And then students still have the opportunity to claim $100 for submitting their proof of vaccination. So it's a win-win-win all around. And then finally, we are moving forward with submitting um, or with giving students who are vaccinated uh, stickers on their ID cards for spring. That is all we have. Dr. Reber, we will turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Heather and Lisa. A round of applause for Heather, Lisa, all members of our RTC task force. So we're about to reach 4,000 students who have received $100 each. That's $400,000, and I can't think of a better investment uh, for our use of our federal stimulus funds. And we will keep um, sending those checks out.
As most of you are aware, our Achieving the Dream leadership and data coaches, Dr. Mary Fifield and Dr. Renee Garcia, visited Hudson County Community College virtually two weeks ago or so. This was their sixth multi-day visit with us since we joined Achieving the Dream over two years ago. And of course, we work with them across the college regularly between visits and our continuing focus on promoting and supporting student completion and student success. Earlier this week, I received our coach's campus follow-up letter, which contains many accolades in addition to concrete and insightful suggestions for our continuous improvement. And I shared that letter with uh, the college community. Uh, Renee and Mary also spoke glowingly about the college and our student success initiatives at last week's meeting of the Board of Trustees. Clearly, we're continuing together to make steady progress in our shared work to achieve continuous improvement in the retention, completion, transfer, and gainful employment of our students. So next, it's my pleasure to invite Dream Team co-chairs, Dr. Heather DeVries. Heather, we work you hard. Dr. Heather DeVries and Dr. Sheila Dynan, who's with us virtually to offer an update on the continuing comprehensive work of the ATD Dream Team. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Sheila's going to start us off. Thank you, Heather. Um, two important uh, pieces of information from um, my perspective of achieving the dream. Um, I will be presenting at the Holistic Student Support Institute on uh, Thursday, November 4th at 210 to 310 as part of a panel discussion focusing on meaningful partnerships in the community to enhance student demand for mental health supports with limited resources. Um, I do know one of the other colleges that has been confirmed that will be working with me is Bunker Hill Community College from Massachusetts. Um, and I don't have the con confirmation of the third college in there yet. Um, the other piece is really very important because we have had success in the past. We got the applications for the Dream Scholars yesterday. And um, achieving the Dream, Dream Scholars program is an experiential learning opportunity for up to eight students from participating Achieving the Dream institutions. And it's designed to enhance key leadership, critical thinking, and networking skills. As a dream scholar, students will be engaged with community act activists, education leaders, peer and dream scholars alumni, and scholars will receive customized programming and exclusive networking sessions that align with their future goals. Chosen through a competitive application process, selected students will engage in the learning process that culminates in, intend in attending Dream 2022 in uh, February 14th through the 17th of 2022. Um, there is a, a, a very short uh, deadline on this. Um, I need to have any applications by noon on November 17th, and we have to uh, submit all of the applications for students under me, um, and I have to have all of those submitted no later than Friday, November 19th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. I have already posted in the link in the chat um, the link for the application and the whole guide book for that. And all of the members of the President's Executive Council, you should have received the information by mail, um, I believe um, Alexa sent it out on Monday or Tuesday. Um, but. This is a very good program for our students to be in, and we did have um, Pedro Mon Monencal last year was a dream scholar, and he, you know, just rocked it right out of the park. He was so wonderful. So if you know people and you know students and reach out to them, or if you have any questions, just let me know, because I think this is a fabulous, <clears throat> excuse me, fabulous way for students to uh, network across the country with their own peers. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, and kudos to you and your team and the Hudson Helps Resource Center and our counselors and advisors that um, over the summer we had a check-in call with ATD National um, to see how our second year of involvement went and they recognized 
our Hudson Helps Resource Center and really this whole umbrella of services as best practice right away um, and referred Sheila to the woman who is coordinating um, the Mental Health Summit as part of the Holistic Student Support Institute. So, so we're in wonderful company with Bunker, Bunker Hill Community College. Um, I'd like to start off by just thanking everyone for partic who participated in meetings with Mary and Renee. We always appreciate um, the, real, the real spirit of, of collaboration and inclus inclusiveness when they do come to campus, um, that people who are asked to have a meeting or do you need to meet with them, would you like to, always say yes and are always actively participating. So we thank you for carving time out of what I know are very, very tight schedules to, to engage with Mary and Renee. Um, as President Reber mentioned, we received their follow-up letter earlier in the week, and the Dream Team will, will take a deep dive into it at its meeting next week. So more information to come there. Otherwise, for year three of our Achieving the Dream work, we've changed, we've had a change in nomenclature. What we used to call the how teams are now implementation teams, really to reflect our focus on implementation um, and, and action this, in this third year. We have 11 implementation teams which were informed by the recommendations, the really hard work of our how teams last year, and other ongoing conversations and initiatives in the Dream Team and at the college. We thank everyone who is providing leadership for those. I will very quickly read down our implementation team leads, um, and then we will circulate this information in an email um, in case anyone wants to get involved, as we hope you will, and you will encourage your colleagues to get involved as well. Uh, Jenny Bobea, Dr. Sean Egan, Laura Samuelson, Kyle Woolley, Crystal Newton, serving as an alumni mentor, Kenny Fabara, Angela Tuzo, Dr. David Clark, Dr. Eric Arkashian, Dr. Sirhan Abdullah, Dr. Gretchen Schultes, Dr. Pamela Bandiopadier, Joe Coniglia, Jacqueline Safont, Matthew LeBrake, Dr. Lori Bird, Lisa Chekowitz, Catherine Sarangelo, John Scanlon, and John Scanlon. So we thank all of those who are really, really putting their, putting extra time and creating creating time to do this. And again, we'll circulate the implementation team structure and the leads for each in an email. And again, we encourage all those who are interested to, to get involved. In closing, um, Sheila mentioned Dream 2022, which is in February. It will be virtual again this year. Um, and the, the call for proposals, session proposals, has been out for several weeks. Um, proposals are being accepted for either a 30-minute or a 60-minute session, and they have slightly different parameters for each. And submissions are due through Achieving the Dreams website by November 8th. So a little bit of room there. So much good work is going on around the college. We absolutely want to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. And you can rest now, but you aren't finished. We'll be calling you up again. Um, so Pedro Morinchel uh, was a, uh, one of eight Dream Scholars at last year's Dream Conference. He's now at Princeton University. When our, our students are so inspirational. Um, okay, so moving right along. Oh, the other thing I want to mention is our um, ATD coaches have recommended that next year uh, when we're eligible, because we'll be in our third year, you have to be in your third year, we should apply for what ATD calls leader college status. These are colleges within the network that are considered to be um, best practice in the work, and uh, we're going to be applying for that next year. So speaking about student success, um, Actually, let me back up. I do want to thank all who are involved, not only on the dream team and the implementation teams, but also those who are leading and supporting our really exciting new Hudson Scholars project uh, and all who are contributing to student success throughout the college. And speaking about student success, one of the highlights of our fall semester uh, that many of you participated in was the recent ribbon cutting celebration of our student center. The events included comments by students and staff, music, mementos and giveaways, great food from Libby's Home Kitchen, and more. And throughout the day, students recorded video testimonials about what Hudson is Home means to them, which are now being posted on our YouTube channel and on our website for all to see. So if you haven't gone and looked at those, go to the, I think the easiest way is to go to the website channel and you'll just see them across the screen. We have a growing number of students. They're really wonderful to to watch. I want to thank Lisa Doherty, Dr. David Clark, Veronica Gerasimo, Angela Tuzzo, 
our facility staff and student leaders and so many others for organizing the wonderful um, groundbreaking of the Student Center, which uh, if you haven't been in there lately, it is a hit. It is alive with students. Students really love it and are using it. And apropos of that, last Saturday, we enjoyed a fabulous open house that began in our student center, which was buzzing with activity and hundreds of prospective students and their families. Uh, the open house included tours of many of our facilities organized and facilitated by faculty, staff, and students throughout the college by many of you. We had over 140 prospective students and guests attend, in addition to more than 80 faculty, staff, peer leaders, and other members of the HCCC family. It was truly a phenomenal day that even included a huge ice sculpture welcoming our visitors to the Culinary Conference Center. The great success of this event was the result of the efforts and the involvement of the entire college community, and I thank everyone who participated. I do want to especially thank, I hope he's here, um, Associate Dean of Enrollment Services, Matt Fessler, and his incredible team for their leadership. As I've said to him several times now, Matt, you truly outdid yourself in leading this spectacular day. Matt, are you here? Uh, can, thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Oh, good. Yes. As you're aware, we're developing educational opportunities for individuals who are incarcerated in the Hudson County Correctional Facility and individuals who were previously incarcerated and are now re-entering society in the workforce. Lori Morgolan and guess who, Dr. Heather DeVries, co-chair, our Incarcerated and Reentry Training Task Force. So Lori and Heather, will you just provide an update of this important work? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. First, I'd like to uh, thank everybody who is on the Incarcerated and Reentry Task Force for their work and guidance, as well as the village um, that is supporting both of these programs. We, we obviously couldn't have done it without you. So in terms of updates, just have a few quick bullets. Um, classes at the correctional facility had been canceled for the past two weeks, but will be resuming on November 1st. Um, and we are actively working on viable options in order for students to make up missed work and class time. We are working on the spring semester schedule with our students and looking at what will be their, their next group of classes that they'll be taking. And there is, will be a meet and greet at the correctional facility with Dr. Eber and the county executive in November. So we're, we're moving along. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, I'll speak to a few bullet points regarding our partnership with New Jersey Reentry Corporation. We are continuing our conversations with them, um, especially with Robert Carter. We've had two really productive meetings and we'll resume weekly meetings starting next week um, to really get our plan up and running for spring. Our strategy for spring offerings is focused on identifying the existing employer rela relationships NJRC has, and then mapping that back to our credit and non-credit programs and courses. As we plan for spring 2022, we are specifically fo focusing on coursework in the areas of welding and culinary. So thank you to, to Dean Burl Yearwood and, and Dr. Ara Karakashian um, for their continued engagement in helping us think through, think through this, this spring planning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. So uh, the postponement of classes at the correctional facility had to do with conditions in the in the jail. This is one of the challenges, one of many challenges offering um, training to incarcerated individuals. But um, I know I'm hearing the students really are valuing the experience. I think we have 20, 20 some students. Fourteen in the degree and seven in the workforce, so it's a, a good, strong beginning, and hopefully we'll be able to make up that missed time. And I, I want to thank, we have several faculty that are teaching in that program, and we, I think Katie Sweeting is one of them, and we, uh, she is concerned appropriately about how to catch up, and we want to, we're, we're working on that one, but thank you all. Our market study and employee position classification project continues, and the report from our consultant, Evergreen Associates, is on track to be completed by the end of this semester. I've asked Vice President Anna Kropitsky to provide an update. Anna.
Thank you, Dr. Reber. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, so just as a quick summary, you can hear? Is, is yeah. that on? Do we know that's on? That might... They'd say yes. It, it's on, okay. Maybe put it on, yeah. All right. Um, so just as a quick summary, I, this is better. In January uh, of 2021, this is when we began um, a college-wide review of all um, employee position descriptions, uh, employee census, staffing table, collective bargaining agreements, and uh, with the guidance and support of Evergreen. We thank all employees college-wide who have participated in the focus group sessions and have completed the job assessment tool survey regarding their positions in the spring of 2021. And then shortly following over the summer and in the beginning of this fall semester, Evergreen began a market study of a cross-section of HCC faculty and staff positions by comparing college salaries to those um, at benchmark community colleges. So Evergreen proposed 15 peer institutions um, and um, for inclusion in the salary survey analysis with feedback from our collective bargaining associations. And most of the recommended benchmark institutions um, are urban diverse um, institutions similar in size. They're located in or near our region um, of, the, of the country. And um, I do want to remind everyone that the details of the study are still on the portal um, under compensation study page. And so at this time, we are anticipating a draft report from Evergreen. Uh, we will formally, as a result, we will formally update all uh, position descriptions college-wide following the completion of the study and um, the receipt of Evergreen's report with recommendations by the end of this calendar year. So this will include developing uh, strategic positioning recommendations in terms of placement, uh, developing recommendations for compensation, um, administration, and providing uh, revised class descriptions and FL FLSA determinations. So that's where we are now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anne. It's a huge project. And uh, you know, a reminder, we'll be sharing this report with everybody. And uh, we are hoping it will be helpful in informing our negotiations next spring. And we are committed to making all the progress we possibly can. I just always want to remind us that um, there are some things that are likely going to take more time in order to be able to uh, fund. So some things will likely be done quickly and some will take more time. But all, all the suggestions will be fully vetted with our community and uh, We'll work through what this uh, helps us do together. Our complex, but it, speaking of complexity, that's complex. This is also complex. Our academic tower project continues to gain momentum. Dr. Nicholas Chevrolati is leading this project in collaboration with our Board of Trustees Capital Projects Advisory Committee. Nicholas and the project architect spoke about the project at yesterday's meeting of the All College Council. And I've asked Nicholas to offer a brief update today and answer any questions you might have. And I, I believe, Peter, I'm, I correct that the All College Council meeting was recorded, right? So that, that will be available for people to watch. So everybody, if you missed that yesterday, you'll have an opportunity to look at, there was really a very good presentation and uh, the architect took us right up on, onto every floor and showed us uh, what, what's happening. So I would encourage you to look at that when it's posted. Nicholas, thanks for your leadership. Uh, thank you, Chris. I would encourage you to uh, take a look at yesterday's video uh, because I'm going to try to condense a 45-minute discussion into about three minutes here. Um, so just to highlight, very excited about the Academic Tower. The Academic Tower represents the final piece of the facilities master plan that was begun many years ago uh, by the college. We are talking about it, building a 135-square-foot, 11-story tower uh, the location is the current parking lot uh, between Enos and Jones. 
It's an important project for the college for a couple of reasons. One, it will include uh, a full gymnasium that will allow us to expand our health sciences and exercise uh, science programs. The gymnasium would be uh, NCAA uh, approved for any future thoughts uh, as far as uh, bringing athletics uh, back to the college. The other thing it will do is it will create a one-stop shop for our students, which is very important. Uh, as you all know, and I think will uh, assist us in uh, serving our students. We also have a black box theater on the uh, fourth floor um, of the site, uh, which we're excited about. We will have brand new classrooms, uh, actually several classrooms, uh, more uh, in excess of what we're uh, losing with the sale of 162 and, and 70 SIP, uh, as well as administrative offices, faculty offices. So I encourage you to take a look at the plans in addition to the ACC uh, portal, on the president's portal, we uploaded the plans themselves. I encourage you to take a look at them. Any questions, feel free to contact me. So everyone knows the cabinet is meeting with the architects on November 10th to review uh, the programs and the floor designs. So if you can offer your comments before them, I'm sure uh, we'd all appreciate it. The project is complex though, because of the capital stack and a couple of other uh, ancillary issues. When I say the capital stack, we anticipate this project will cost about $68 million uh, in pre-COVID dollars. That price has probably gone up uh, uh, during the pandemic. And that will be a combination of our capital reserves, chapter 12, uh, some fundraising, uh, Nicole, <laughs> um, the, uh, as well as looking towards the county and also the New Jersey uh, state tax incentive program. So uh, we are, Moving through that process, we anticipate the tax incentive program uh, coming online sometime in the spring, and that will sort of help us and guide us as far as a start date on construction. We're anticipating right now a four-year plan. Um, the construction will take about 26 to 28 months. I do want to mention that we've also partnered with the Hudson County Economic Development Corporation to have a request for expression of interest. Uh, this is to see if there is an opportunity to partner with a private developer to take advantage of the air rights, which exist uh, above uh, the academic tower. We've already had one meeting uh, with one prospective partner. We have two more scheduled tomorrow, and we're going to be moving through that process this winter and come to a conclusion uh, early in the first quarter of next year. Uh, the one question that we've received over and over is the parking situation. You know, with the sale of 162, 168 SIP and the uh, construction of this project, we are eliminating the existing parking on campus. Dr. Reber, the Board of Trustees, the Cabinet, this is recognized, this is a priority. Chris has made it very clear that we need to find a solution before we been, uh, begin construction on the academic tower. I'm currently in discussions with uh, multiple entities in the surrounding area. That is moving simultaneous uh, to the conversation we're having. Again, I welcome any uh, questions. You can contact me via email. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nicholas. It's an unbelievable project. And, um, and you know, I want to uh, comment on the, the, the gym. So as Nicholas said yesterday and today, um, the gym, it is uh, designed for competition. It was also designed to support our academic programs as as is the Wellness Center, which is going to be wonderfully supportive of our growing exercise science program. But I'm going to be a little bolder than what Nicholas just said. Um, I'm going to say, as your president, until someone tells me otherwise, we will be having athletics. We are going to return to an athletics program. And um, actually, it has the support of, I know, so many members of our college community, also our board. A number of our trustees are really supportive of that. So. Um, I, I, I have said this before and I haven't gotten to it yet, but I want to appoint a task force this year to begin working on envisioning that athletics program, uh, what we might want to do first. I, I'm, I'm anticipating sports like men's and or women's basketball, volleyball um, would be sort of early uh, uh, starts to, to the program, which can then grow over time. And what we also want to make sure we do with this program is we do it right, academics first, that any coaches we hire are committed to that principle and that the program is designed to 
promote leadership skills, academic skills, and uh, with the goal that our student athletes will outperform their non-athlete peers academically. And so we're going to start that work. Uh, and I know some of you are very interested in that. Uh, next, I've asked, we're almost finished, and we are going to open it to questions. Um, I've asked the Vice President for Advancement and Communications, Nicole Johnson, to share planning uh, that I'm excited about. It's currently underway for this year's Foundation Holiday Gala, which is titled Hats Off to Hudson he Hudson's Heroes. Nicole. Thank you, Dr. Reaver. Good afternoon, everyone. I am hoping that you'll plan to mark your calendars for Hats Off to Hudson's Heroes on Thursday, December 2nd of this year as we celebrate our partners who were instrumental in helping us successfully navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. This year, I'm happy to share that we will honor Jose Pepe Garcia of Maverick Building Services Maverick is a longtime partner of the college and Pepe's personal story, which he will share is a testament to the value we all place on education, determination, and perseverance. Event attendees will experience the outstanding culinary performance of 150 of our students and the chef instructors who support them cooking for 150 of our students champions our donors. This is a big deal as our culinary arts program is number six in the nation, which I know many of us know. Yes. This high visibility opportunity will really allow our donors to interact directly with our students and many of you who will be in the room. We have our foundation director and our college trustees to thank for helping us deliver this event for 23 years and counting. So thanks to them. Um, whether you can attend or not, there's an opportunity for you to participate in this event, which ultimately supports our students' greatest needs. Please be on the lookout for a gala invitation, which will be blasted today. And if you have any other recommendations about potential attendees, I welcome your email with name and contact information. I will gladly add them to our distribution list, which we are growing. And I thank you all for all that you continue to do to support uh, our foundation and our fundraising efforts as we look to do more for the, for the students who we serve. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Nicole. The event theme is wonderful, and it's also wonderful having you on board. We really are delighted you're here. And, you know, my hope is that this event, we can actually celebrate and thank uh, the members of our maintenance and facilities staff, our public safety and security staff, and our IT staff, who collectively were truly heroes leading us through the pandemic. Yes. And, and speaking of celebrating our employees, I'm pleased to share that the Office of Human Resources is launching an annual award and recognition program for all employees. This is in addition to what we currently do. I've invited Vice President Anna Kropitsky to return to explain the Hudson is Home Employee Recognition Program. Anna. Thank you, Chris. Heather, you have three returns on my two, so they... <laughs> If I haven't, if you haven't heard me mention this before, I'm just so happy that Lisa Williams has joined our HR team. And so as we've been enthusiastically brainstorming about what our office does, um, we both recognize the value of employees and the value of employee recognition. And so um, we do have a number of recognition opportunities already existing. We have the Hudson Employee Spotlight. We have the uh, STARS program that recognizes our employees for years of service. We have the um, HCCC Foundation Employee Courtesy Service Awards. And then we also have the Philip Johnston um, Award for Excellence in Teaching that is coming up at um, uh, January College Service Day. So Lalisa and I wanted to just take it up a notch. And so uh, the Office of Human Resources is pleased to launch 
an annual award and recognition program for all employees that we would like to, uh, to call Hudson is Home Employee Recognition Program. So um, starting November 1st, as you will get um, more information and a flyer and then the way to nominate, we will open up a nomination uh, period for about 30 days. Um, we welcome the college community to come together via our committee. So if you're interested in participating and selecting the awardees, please reach out to myself or Lisa. Uh, as always, we will usually reach out to our professional associations, all college council and any other volunteers, who, those who may be voluntold, <laughs> although we do like volunteers, uh, to participate in this uh, program. And then we will uh, have a celebration as we usually do. Dr. Reba likes parties, we like parties. So we will um, op uh, close this fall semester uh, with the celebration of, and of our employees. So just as a um, uh, fast forward, our, some of the nominations include Inspirational Leadership Award, Diversity Award, Innovation, a Newbie Award, Collaboration and Team Achievement, and outstanding faculty. Um, so watch out for communication. Uh, please reach out to myself or Lisa if you have questions. If you would like to participate, we're happy to have you. And I think that concludes our program. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you Dr. Reba. We certainly want to celebrate and thank our colleagues for their excellence and for living and breathing our shared experience that Hudson is home. So we value these additional opportunities to bring visibility and appreciation to the work of our dedicated colleagues. And I do love a party. Uh, I, we need to do more partying. Uh, so at long last, we now open the meeting to questions, comments, topics of celebration. Um, you know, I, can I just mention, isn't it wonderful how we have invested in technology that is allowing us, this is getting better and better, right? But it, we have this technology all over the place now. We've invested millions of dollars and we're able to come together physically, but also expand access, not just, not just because of the pandemic, but expand access to others who can't be physically here in chairs. Collectively, what do we have? We've had over 100 members participating today through WebEx. We have another you know, pretty full room here on ground. So this is our new normal, I think, and we're gonna keep um, making sure that technology works for us.